and I am hitting record on this because I want to make sure that we record this for people who couldn't attend tonight. But I can think of no better way to kick off our self-care series than um, by introducing Charlotte Reed. Uh, she is a, an art therapist. She's going to tell you a little bit more about what she does. Um, but she is an amazing human, a gifted artist. And I believe she really does understand uh, self-care and practices it personally. But she's going to, I've seen her in action. I've taken a class from her before and uh, she is the real deal. So I am personally excited to introduce uh, Charlotte Reed and I'm just going to turn the floor over to her. All right, thank you. Um, so everybody, um, I wanted to just start by, by giving you a little bit of background about me and why I am passionate about um, using creativity as a way of self-care. Um, so I grew up in a very creative family. My mother actually um, did a, a salt dough, a bread dough business. And for a while, she actually supported our family. Um, so I kind of grew up in the midst of that creative energy. And so from the time I was very young, I was, you know, stealing bits of dough and making mud pies in the backyard and all kinds of stuff. Uh, when I was 12, um, I was diagnosed with um, a genetic disorder that was going to cause me to lose most of my vision. Um, didn't didn't phase me in the slightest. I still decided I'm going to continue creating as long as I can. Uh, but there was a part of me that was like, yeah, when I go to college, I'm going to have to do something serious. And, you know, you can't be an artist, you know, that doesn't make any money. So I started off in education, um, kind of got a little scared away uh, by some of the things I was required to do to get into the program. And so I went into mental health and human services. Um, had my kids, got married, well, not in that order, I married, had my kids, um, and came back to school and was actually taking some art classes just as a way to kind of uh, care for myself because uh, mental health and human services is, is, can be pretty heavy sometimes. And I was taking a ceramic sculpture class um, and thought, everything was going great. And uh, the teacher said, okay, your next assignment, your final assignment is you need to build a life-size sculpture in sections. And I went, oh, darn, the gig is up. <laughs> They're going to know I'm not an artist. I am in big trouble. Um, but I decided I would just fake it till I made it. And um, I did. And that's when I decided, okay, I am an artist, I can do this. And so I immediately went to the bursar's office and I changed my major for the third time um, to become a fine arts major. And I was so excited, I went into the uh, disability student services and I was like, I'm gonna be an artist. And they went, you can't do that. And I went, why? And they're like, because you're blind. And I went, oh, well, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> so I graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, I became a professional artist, um, but unbeknownst to me, um, I was uh, diagnosed in 2012 with uh, a more severe form of the genetic disorder that I have and was told that I was going to lose the rest of my vision. Um, so I had one of those moments of, you know, crisis, okay, maybe I'm not going to be able to be an artist for the rest of my life need plan B. So I'm going to go back to school and um, get my degree in social work because I figured I knew what, um, you know, kind of some of the services were around um, disability and they weren't that great. So I was like, I can do this better. Um, so I gave up art and I went to school full time as a master's um, program. And within two semesters, I was um, really, really miserable. Um, I was depressed. Um, I actually became suicidal um, at a time and could not understand what was going on. And then it occurred to me, I didn't have a creative outlet. I had left all my art making, put it aside 
didn't have any clay to pound, any, you know, colors to scribble with. I did not have that creative outlet. And I realized very quickly I needed that back. And so it was at that point I decided, okay, even if I lose all of my vision, I will find a way to create because this is what I need in my life. It is healthy for me. Um, it, it doesn't matter if I'm gonna paint the Mona Lisa or sculpt the David. I'm not gonna do that. It's about um, having that ability to get out that energy in my body, um, thoughts in my brain, whether they're positive, negative, things that I can deal with and be able to connect and communicate with other people. And so I decided to go into art therapy um, and actually was did both masters at the same time, which people were like, okay. <laughs> um, but anyhow, that's how I came to really um, feel like art therapy is um, important. And for us to be creative is really, really important. And I run into a lot of people who say, um, I'm not an artist. And I tell them, that's fine. You don't have to be an artist. Yes, I don't expect you to get your piece into the MoMA. Um, but just being able to create is really good for us. It's good for our brains. And so we're going to spend a little time creating tonight. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how the brain works and how creativity can help us um, de-stress um, and actually, um, you know, problem solve and look at our... Um, look at things that we run into in life in different ways and can be really healthy for us. So let me start by talking about our brains. Um, and I'm not gonna give you any like heavy anatomy, um, but there is a really neat um, kind of uh, model for thinking about the brain and how it's structured and it, it deals with the hand. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the brain hand puppet before, um, but there's, there's kind of three parts to the brain. Um, and so we have the wrist and that is, is basically like our brain stem, our spinal cord, our brain stem um, and our cerebellum. And sometimes this is referred to as the reptilian brain or the primitive brain. Um, Cause this is the part of the brain that is responsible for basically keeping us alive. It's the survival part of our brain. So it is um, responsible for things like keeping our heart rate regulated, keeping us breathing, keeping our body temperature, um, the right temperature, um, telling us when we need to eat, um, when we need to go to the restroom, all those things that we need to keep us safe and alive. And it also is that, that somewhat comes into that fight and flight um, response when we you know, sense danger and we run away. So if we lift our fingers up, our thumb is, is kind of under here. And this would be um, kind of the mammalian part of the brain. This is where your amygdala and your um, hypothalamus lie in your brain. And um, this is kind of your emotional part of your brain. So this is where uh, we have feelings of love or feelings of anger. Um, so this is kind of going beyond um, where we're just surviving to actually connecting with people, um, falling in love, because that is actually, you know, helpful for us to be in, in connection with each other, because um, we can help each other out um, in help and survival. So this is the emotional part of our brain. Um, this is also, you know, part of the brain that when we get afraid, um, when we feel stressed. Um, this is also kind of connected to that survival part where we're thinking about, okay, uh, there's a fire, we need to get out of here. Um, or there's a test, I'm freaked out. <laughs> Those are all parts of that mammalian brain, that kind of inner brain. And if we wrap our fingers back around that uh, mammalian brain, um, this is our cerebral cortex and frontal cortex. Think of your, your fingers in the front is your frontal cortex. Um, and then this whole thing wrapped around the top, that's your cerebral cortex. And this is, um, this is the part of the brain that we as humans kind of, uh, we have the largest part of this. We share this a little bit with primates. 
Um, but this is our thinking brain. This is the executive part of our brain. This is where we actually stop and think and say, hmm, uh, let's decide what is the best way to deal with this test. Now, we don't use this part of our brain when we're actually in danger because if there is a fire raging in our house, we're not gonna sit and think, well, how long is it gonna take for the curtains to actually catch on fire? That would not be good if we were stuck in this part of our brain. So this part of our brain will actually go offline when we feel in danger or we have high emotion. And so we kind of drop back down into that mammalian brain. So the reason I like to talk about the three parts of the brain is because um, we know that art um, kind of develops in these three parts. Think about when you were a kid or when you had kids or you've seen kids, um, the way we develop our art making is actually um, connected with this way of our brain being developed. So what's the first thing that kids do when they start making art? Color, scribble. Scribble, scribble, yeah, exactly. And usually that scribbling is pretty um, movement oriented. Uh, it's, you know, they're not like going real slow. It's, it's kind of they're getting in control of their body. And the first thing we develop as humans as we're growing up is movement and sensation. These are our survival mechanisms. Um, you know, if we want to survive as an infant, we need to understand um, there's a weird sensation in my body that tells me I'm hungry, I need food, I'm going to cry, or there's something cold and wet in my diaper, I need to get that fixed, and so I'm going to, I'm going to cry. So we're, we're tuned in to sensations and movement. So if we look at kids learning to draw, they actually do a lot of movement, and they also play with their art materials. So finger paints, they will sit and feel it. They may rub it on their face. Uh, they may draw on their skin with the markers. That is all kind of getting to know how things move and how things feel. And so we're gonna start out our art today with that level of art making. So we're gonna go back to our childhood and we're gonna do a little art making. So what I want you to do is take your piece of paper and we're going to do a little scribbling. Um, but before, <laughs> sorry, my watch is going off. Um, so what I'm going to have you do is you can decide whether you want to um, move fast or slow, depending on how you're feeling. Um, if you're feeling a little bit anxious about this, like I'm not an artist, I don't think I can do this. Let me suggest that you use your non-dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, use your left hand. If you're left-handed, use your right hand. And the reason I tell people to do this is because this gets you out of your thinking brain for a moment, because you're more focused on the sensation of this feels weird to me. And so you're not gonna be as critical of this looks a mess. You're gonna be focused on, can I move my hand? So if you're feeling a little anxious, use your non-dominant hand. But take a deep breath before we start this. Kind of center yourself and check in with your body. And then just put your color to the paper and we're just going to move around and make some lines. And so I'm gonna give you a few minutes to just fill up your paper and you're gonna do one continuous line. So you can cross over yourself, go around.
All right. You want to keep on drawing, you're welcome to. But once your paper begins to get a little full, I'm, I'm working in a, a sketchbook tonight, but I'll, I'll kind of show you what I'm doing. So it basically is just kind of a continuous line scribble. And this is a really great exercise to do if you are maybe sitting at work and you're struggling with um, thinking about what to do, maybe about a project, um, if you're uh, having trouble with doing some, you know, accounting, um, if you've if you've hit a wall with a situation, um, and you're you're kind of struggling to think about a solution, stop and take a piece of paper and do this little exercise because what this does is it shifts your brain into a different part. And it actually allows that part of your brain that is thinking about executive function and trying to, to solve a problem. And it, it drops it down into a lower level of thinking and gives your brain a moment to relax and kind of reset. And then when you go back to thinking about that problem, you may actually find that you have a new solution. So try this sometime when you're, when you're stuck. Okay. So we've done the kind of bottom level of art making. And I, I don't like to call it bottom level because it's, it, it's still a really um, fascinating level of art making. If you think about, uh, there are some artists, famous artists who worked in this, in this way. Um, one of the most famous is Jackson Pollock. If you've seen his work, he was the gentleman who um, basically would take paint and just fling it all over the canvas. Um, he was a very kinesthetic, movement-oriented artist. Um, and so he basically had a lot of energy built up in his body. Um, he dealt with a lot of mental illness. Um, and he would use that paint um, and just fling it all over the place. So he was not as concerned about, am I making a pretty picture? He was more concerned about um, expressing emotion and getting that energy out of his body by doing this kinesthetic mo movement. There's also a, a really wonderful artist named Nick Cave um, that you can look up sometime. And he makes these wonderful sound suits. So he does these costumes. And one of his first suits was out of sticks. And when the person moves in the suit, it makes this wonderful noise. And it has this lovely flow to it. And so again, that's that sensation part of art making that we're, we're focusing on the senses. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kind of the second part of the brain, that emotional part of the brain. Um, and as we develop, we start to um, kind of develop some emotions around, uh, you know, children start to say, I love you. And they'll say, I'm mad. Usually around two, three to five, um, that's when they start to develop those things. And kind of the second thing that we see in art making development is children will start to express, um, they're starting to see the world around them and they're starting to try and draw that. So you'll see them make M's for birds, or um, you'll see them start to draw kind of rudimentary people. Um, they actually have a, a name for it called cephalopods, which I think is lovely, but those are the little kind of circles with the stick arms and maybe some eyes. Um, but that is the child recognizing that there is a world around them that has shapes um, and they're trying to mimic those shapes, but they're also they will tell you wonderful stories. They're, they're developing their emotions, um, how they feel about those things in their world around them. So they will start to tell you stories. They may still have a little bit of a, a scribble, but they'll tell you, this is Mr. Policeman and he's talking to the flower and it doesn't necessarily look like a flower or a policeman, but they have a whole story and they interact. interact. And so this is kind of the second part of art making. 
And so I'm going to invite you to engage in that second level of art making, which we call the perceptive. So you're perceiving the world around you. You're looking at objects and, and you know, seeing them, what they look like, recognizing shapes. And then it's also called the effective level. So it's feeling. So um, am I mad, sad, happy, um, afraid of what I'm seeing? How does it relate to me? So what I'd like you to do with your drawing now is I'm going to give you um, some time to really work on this is I want you to look at the scribbles and this is kind of like um, the the game you used to play maybe as a kid where you look at the clouds and you'd pick out the shapes in the clouds. This is what you're going to do with your scribble. So I want you to take some time and I want you to see if you can make out images in your scribble and then find what they are and then begin to color those in and develop them more. And you can actually add lines, you can add color, but pick out at least three or four shapes in your scribble and color those in. And I'm going to give you some time to work on that. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Charlotte, since Lisa's just joining us, maybe you could recap for a sec while we're doing our little shapes. Would you mind? No, not at all. So Lisa, where did you, did you, were you able to see the, the scribble? She came in um, just after we finished that when you were talking about, I believe when you were talking about the next stage. So she okay. might need some, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this the scribble is the first um, the first kind of art that children make, um, and it's really based on movement um, and sensation. So kids, when they're drawing, um, when they're doing those scribbles, they're usually they're really experimenting with the material. They're seeing what that crayon or that paintbrush can do, and they're seeing what their body can do. So they're moving a lot over that paper. Um, they're listening to, um, what does that crayon sound like? Sometimes they'll say, oh, it's scratchy. Um, so they're really tuned in to the movement and the sound and the sensations that that's making. So with this first part of the art making, you're going to choose whatever color you want and you're going to just start to move your crayon or marker, whatever you're using around on the paper and draw a scribble. And I told people, if you feel anxious about doing this, like I'm not an artist, um, try using your non-dominant hand because um, this puts our brain in a different mode where we're not being critical of ourselves. Um, we're concentrating more on, um, can I move my non-dominant hand? So if you're right-handed, use your left hand. If you're left-handed, use your right hand. Um, but if you feel comfortable enough, you can use your dominant hand. It's just kind of a little trick to get us out of our own critical brains. So while you're working, I'm going to invite everybody to share what they have chosen as their favorite coloring implement. And if, if they um, have another art form that they like to do, I'd like to hear about that too. So who would like to go first? I have Sharpies. Is that what you're asking? Yay. Yeah, Sharpies. And I bought them yesterday because I needed to get something quickly for today. <laughs> <laughs> that was my whole idea. Now, do you do any other types of creative work? I do flower arrangements. Oh, wonderful. Mm hmm. I was showing Charlotte, I have a um, big basket of markers that I'm using 
Um, I have been doing a project for the last 60 days. Today's day 61. It's called the 100 Day Project. And I am not an artist, but I am learning to create art. Uh, so I'm, I'm making a little four by six card every day. And I've tried lots of different types of things. I started with collage and some paperwork, but I've landed on markers. I'm really just enjoying coloring. So the last probably three to four weeks has just been me and my markers coloring every day. So I'm enjoying that a lot. Oh, cool. I have markers also. Oh, Crayola. And I really like the markers. These these actually have kind of a pointy. They're they're big fat markers, but they got a little point. Mm. So they're pretty easy to color in the lines. Because I'm that color in the lines person. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have done a lot of art in my life. I actually had my own art business for a while and I do oils and watercolors. Um, little mixed medium, some pastels. Our parents were artists. They were self-taught artists. And I think that, I think I probably got the art love from them. Um, our mother owned, and I say our because Sue is my sister. Um, our mother owned a, uh, her own art, her own flower business. So Sue has kind of taken over the flower business, although I do some of that also, but she does very, very well, makes arrangements for her church and things too. I'm just using some cheap crayons, um, very cheap, but it's a new box. I taught kindergarten for 10 years. And when I was in art for education, um, for, you know, art for, art for elementary school teachers, mm -hmm. um, they always told us, don't make a model because the kids will always say, I can't do that good. I can't do that. I said, I can make the model because they can all say, I can do better than that. <laughs> and yes, I did. I, I, I would make models and yes, they would be better than me. My sister got all the artistic ability in our family. My dad was artistic. My grandpa was artistic. My sister took it all. She can, I let her come in and she decorates my house. And, you know, I, I have these things. I say, okay, you put them out. She does it. It looks wonderful. Um, I, I've just never been artistic, but it's fun to scribble. Mm -hmm. Oh, as a kid, I used to like doing the scribbles where you would take a black crayon and, and scribble and then color all different colors and then color black on top and then scrape it off. That was my kind of art. Oh, yeah. The scratch art is great. I love yeah. that stuff. Okay. Well, Charlotte, I'm like Bev and I went for crayons, but I, I borrowed the... Uh, box of 96 that I bought Woo! for my granddaughter to use when she's here because I really wanted to use periwinkle that's my favorite and uh you have to have one of the big really big boxes to have that color so that's what I did my scribbling with I'm kind of regretting it though because it's it's uh, very light so it's, a, it's more of a challenge than I thought it was going to be to find shapes in it to turn into other drawings so we'll mm. we'll see <laughs> Well, I like that you you practice a little further self care by treating yourself to the big box of crayons. That's awesome. <laughs> and I will admit, I absolutely love crayons. I know they get a bad rap. Um, we're actually taught in um, school, studying to be art therapists, that we shouldn't put out crayons when we're working with adults because it can be insulting to them. Um, so I, I like to get the fancy artist crayons, um, but I still like to offer crayons because there's something just wonderful about the colors for me. I just, I like the, the waxy feel and I brought colored pencils. 
I have three boxes of colored pencils. I keep getting colored pencils. People think I need to slow down and like color more, but I never do. So I pull the ones out that have the double colors so I can change my mind all the Ooh. time on the colors. So oh. that's what I have tonight. So Cheryl, do they have a color on each end? Is that what? Yes. Okay. There's a, I have, yeah, and that's my third box. Yeah, for some reason I was, people starting to give me, a few years ago, they kept giving me colors. I think they wanted me to calm down and sit in color. <laughs> but of course I never did. So I, then I had to make a choice on the box that I would use. And I said, oh, these are nice because there's double colors. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway. I know they have um, colored pencils that have multiple colors in the lead. Oh yeah. yeah. I, actually, I have crayons that are that are kind of like that. Um, but those are really fun because you never know what color, depending on which way you kind of twist it or color, it could be a different color. So yeah, they're kind of fun. Yeah. Okay, a few more minutes and then we're going to we're going to move on, but take your take your time. You can always finish this later and and work on it while I'm I'm doing some more talking, but So while you're finishing up, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, art therapy and what it actually entails. I don't know if anybody is, is familiar with art therapy. Has anybody ever visited an art therapist? Mm -mm. Not for myself, but when my son-in-law died, we took my two granddaughters. They were seven and 10 oh, okay. and they went through art therapy for two years and it was it was amazing to watch these folks work with the girls. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very effective um, therapeutic um, practice, especially for um, people who've experienced trauma um, or loss, because when we experience, sometimes when we experience trauma, I know that they're, um, there's often, a, it's a visual thing, so we may see something. And then if we are asked to go to a therapist and talk about what we've experienced, that can be kind of difficult to take that visual experience and turn it into 
you know, a verbal story that can be difficult and, and very difficult for some people who don't like to talk or um, who are in the midst of, you know, maybe some dealing with, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. There are things that just keep our minds from wanting to process that information. And so the wonderful thing about art is it works with a different part of the brain. So it can actually kind of get to um, those, those stressors and issues coming at it from a different point, you know, almost kind of like it's, it, we sneak in the back door um, with art making and it, it allows us to you know, really relax. Um, it's, it's really kind of fascinating, but art therapy just essentially is, is using art, um, art making or art materials um, in the therapeutic process. So people who are art therapy, art therapists go to school and they learn many of the same, um, you know, counseling techniques and they learn all about the brain and psychology and we have to do research and <laughs> all that fun stuff. Um, but in the process, we learn how to use art um, as a way to help people communicate in a different way than just having to do that verbally. Um, and there's a whole field of expressive therapies um, where you actually go beyond just visual art to using um, performing arts or music or writing or song. Um, and that taps into a whole other realm of, you know, allowing us to communicate and express ourselves, um, use our bodies, release energy. So it's, it's really, a pretty powerful um, field, and especially for people who have, have been to, um, you know, regular talk therapists and, and have felt that it just didn't fit. Um, it can be a really powerful therapeutic field practice for them. But it's a good um, practice for us just for caring for ourselves um, to practice a little bit of art. Um, when we color, we're not necessarily doing art therapy, it, it's therapeutic, but art therapy really entails having a, a trained person with you on that journey. I always say it's like taking a hike. Um, you can certainly go on a hike by yourself um, and you can have a wonderful hike. You can see lots of birds and trees and experience nature, um, but hiking with um, somebody who is a, a trained guide um, takes that hike to a whole new level. They can tell you what bird that is in the tree and how old that tree is. And um, they can steer you uh, clear of, you know, a possible badger hole that they see along the way. So um, it's just nice to have that kind of guide as you're going through the process. But certainly using art as a way to care for ourselves is really important because like I said, it gets us into a different part of our brain and I tell people, even if you don't feel like you're artistic, um, if you don't have an artistic bone in your body, it's still good to create because um, research has shown that we have a creative side. Many people express that in different ways. We may sing, we may dance, we may bake pies, we may do woodworking. Um, my husband does computer engineering. That's his creative outlet, seems strange, but um, he's being creative when he writes code. So we just have to find what that is that helps us to be creative and get into that, our creative part of our brain. So if it's, um, you know, going out and arranging plants in your garden, if it's um, designing a new outfit for you to wear or for somebody else to wear, uh, if it's decorating your house, those are all creative outlets that kind of help us to, to get in a better, healthier frame of mind. So I just would encourage everybody to kind of find um, their creative outlet. And part of what I try and do um, in my business is to kind of go beyond just colored pencils and paints, which are great forms of, of you know, art, um, but do things like make paper or play with clay or dance and sing, um, even splash paint on the sidewalk um, so that people can find their way of being creative. Okay, so has everybody found some objects in their scribbles? Yes. Okay. 
what we're going to do now is I'm going to have, um, how many people do we have to get all together, Margaret? We have uh, there are nine plus you, so 10 of us right now, Charlotte. Okay, so let's do this. Let's break up into three groups. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little assignment to do in your group. And so this is, this is gonna work on that, um, that third level of the brain. So the, the cerebral cortex, that top level, that executive level, that real thinking level, um, kids eventually get to that level in their artwork and their art making. So we develop kind of that third level of creativity or art making. And that is the point where we start to um, create with multiple steps. So it may be creating a kite that requires us to um, fold paper and uh, glue sticks. Um, in drawing, it is oftentimes that age where um, kids are creating like whole bodies, they have um, dimension to their figures. So they, they may actually work with the idea of perspective. So like, what does the arm look like when it's coming towards you or when it's hidden behind the back? Um, those body shapes change when we move in different directions. So they're thinking about those kind of um, more difficult concepts in the brain. And then also we see this develop in symbolism when kids start drawing. And I don't know if anybody went, probably went through that phase um, where you did your own lettering. Do you remember bubble lettering? <laughs> you lettered everything. Um, you were finding your own style. You were finding what was your identity. So um, that is a very typical phase for kids to go through in their art making is they do, you know, you may see boys doing like more angular letters and they're writing out, you know, they copy, um, you know, manga words or something like that. And girls, they may do more kind of curvy rounded letters and they may draw, you know, cats inside their, their letters or, you know, the, the circle on top of the eyes. Those are all like ways of expressing what symbolizes you? Um, and there's a lot of storytelling and um, communication that goes on in that level. And so what we're gonna do is when you get into your groups, um, I want you to take one of your symbols, pick one of your symbols, and everybody's gonna pick a symbol. And then I want you as a group to come up with a story using those, um, those pictures that you picked out. So pick out an image, um, you can give it a name, whatever you wanna do, but you're gonna come up with a story within your group. And you're gonna, can be a very short story, you can even write a poem, you could write a song, whatever your group feels like, you know, is, is moving their creative button at the moment, do it and um, just work together to create something. All right, any questions mm. on that? Okay. All right, Have I've got- fun. And remember, if you start to get into that critical brain where you say, oh, I can't do this, just say, okay, maybe I can't, but I'm gonna do it for right now. And we're not gonna judge it. We're just gonna do it, okay? Awesome. Thanks, Charlotte. I've got everybody ready to go into rooms. So uh, I'll see you in there in just a little bit. All right. So do we have everybody? Okay, am I in a room with anybody? I don't think I am.
Just give us about five minutes in the rooms and then bring us back, period. I want to be mindful of people's time, period. No meeting. Audio setting, menu light. Open chat panel, alt plus H, but open chat panel, alt plus H, button. Breakout room, record on this computer, left there, alt plus window content, window. Record on this computer, left breakout room. Breakout, window content. Breakout room, inside the breakout room, colon room, read, text, join breakout room, button. Window content, window. Join breakout room, button. Join breakout room button. Unit phone, unit phone, map all step four, unit effort, breakout room. Oh.
Welcome back everyone from the break rooms. I hope that you had a great time. I'm going to turn it back over to Charlotte as she closes up our evening for us. Charlotte, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Darn yes. technology. Um, so did everybody have fun telling stories and coming up with um, like characters for their their graphics yes. things that they created? Yes. Good. I, I discovered that Linda's an incredible storyteller. We <laughs> had a great time. It was very fun. You just have to be willing to, to play. Yes. And Linda, I am so glad you said that because that really is part of the key to creativity is allowing yourself the ability to play. Um, I, I go to workshop after workshop with other artists and kind of the underlying theme is, you know, artists get into their heads too much and they, they hit these blocks where they can't create. And the solution is just to play and relax and kind of get in touch with their inner child. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to introduce this way of of thinking about creativity in all the different realms of the brain, because they, they line up with those realms of the brain, is because we don't have to be creative just on that um, top level of our brains where we have to draw the perfect picture or do multiple steps or do it perfectly. Um, art making can look like um, splashing paint all over a piece of paper or um, scribbling or doodling um, or doing something more sensory. I don't know if you've ever um, played with clay and just you know, taken some water and smoothed it across the clay. Um, that can be really relaxing too and puts us in a different part of our brain. So I hope um, that you all take away tonight um, just that notion that when you're feeling stuck or maybe a little stressed or anxious, um, which gosh, we have nothing to be stressed or anxious about right now, right? <laughs> um, if you just take a few moments to be creative and that can look like, uh, you know, drawing, taking out your crayons and drawing a rainbow just so that you can see the colors, not so you can draw a perfect rainbow, just so you can um, experience the colors or even hear the sound of scribbling or even smell the crayons. Um, they actually did a study that said that the smell of crayons actually lowers people's blood pressure because they have that positive um, connection with their childhood. So even if it's just getting out some paint or colors and just playing with them, I would highly encourage you to do that. And again, if you get stuck in your work, um, whatever you're do, doing, crunchy numbers or arranging flowers and you just can't quite figure out a solution, take a moment and stop and doodle um, or even just move your body for a few minutes and get yourself into a different part of your brain to give that thinking part a moment to relax. And then when you come back, you may find an amazing solution. So with that, um, I want to be mindful of people's time because um, time is you know, protecting your time is part of self-care. So I appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, and if you wanna know more about art making um, or art therapy, you're welcome to um, come to my website, which is artequals.org, um, or you can contact me directly and I'd be happy to talk to you and um, even invite you to come to the studio and just play and relax and have a good time, so. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Charlotte. This was amazing. I don't know about you guys, but I had a great time. Um, and I'm grateful that we recorded this so that we can share it. So if you know anyone that might enjoy this, let us know so that we can share this with them. Our next session is gonna be in two weeks and uh, our presenters are gonna be Stephanie and Cheryl. They're gonna be talking about clean eating and tea. And I'm very excited to hear from these ladies. Um, is there anything you guys wanna say before we close about what we're gonna be doing in a couple weeks. Oh wait, Sue, did you wanna say something? I just wanted to say thank you to Charlotte because I never really relax 
And for me to just sit here and goof around and relax, just all of you, thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. And I want to know her website again. Yes, yeah, Charlotte, can you give it to us? Yes, it's uh, www.art-equals, E-Q-U-A-L-S dot org. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll be visiting. All right. Yay. Thank you. Thank great. you. Thank you, Thanks, Sue. We're so glad you were able to do some self-care during this time. It's exactly what we were hoping for. Totally. Um, so uh, Cheryl, Stephanie, anything you want to tell us before we close? Well, I'm going to talk about um, the basics of root vegetables and the benefits of those awesome. and how to do different tonics and some different kinds of drinks and teas and things from the root vegetables, which tie totally into Cheryl's thing. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm just going to talk oh. about some of the wellness teas that we have and some of the ingredients and what it says it helps you with, um, you know, uh, why, you know, we use the herbs like the Indians and, and the, and the barks from trees and stuff. And that was their medicine at the time. And a lot of what is in the wellness teas, um, come directly, uh, from those plants and trees. Awesome. And I see that Lorna has raised her hand, Lorna. Um, so it would really like feed my self care and fill me up if Stephanie and Bev and I could sing our little song that we wrote. Oh, yes. okay. I would love yes. that. Yes. Let me just say, if you are not able to stay, please feel it's okay for you to go. If we want to honor your time, it's after eight. So if you need to go, you know, please feel free to leave. No worries about it. But if you can stay, we want to hear the song created by Lorna's group. So Lorna, take it away. Okay. I hope it's okay with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, hold your picture up. Okay. Butterfly. Fish. And flowers. Oh my. Butterfly. Fish. And flowers. Oh my. Butterfly. Fish. And flowers. Oh my. Through our imagination, we will fly. And oh, nicely done, group. Love nicely it. Love done. it. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you guys well, so much I, for sharing that. Oh, Cheryl, go I ahead. Started out with we have, we have to brag on our, our group here. Okay. So interesting that Lisa drew mountains and trees, and Sue drew hearts and some flowers, and I drew f fish. So we just went on a hike, a five mile hike to a lake way back with the mountains, with a meadow with flowers. And we spent the night and then we hiked out the next day. So that was our story mm, and we're sticking awesome. to it. Oh, I love it. Oh, <laughs> wow. That is great. Stick Through fish it. also? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but your fish, oh, okay. This was ethereal. It was very light. It was like a, 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 a just a school of this fish, but you can't really see it. Um, okay. The other, the, the, there's some. It was salmon color fish, but they're very light. Um, I think that's yeah, interesting. And, we both drew fish. I know. <laughs> I, and and this is just my stuff is like I'm. I think I need help because my stuff is weird. I I I colored a, a, a something that looked like a uvula in the back of your throat a sky, a green bowler, and some dirt. I don't know, and the fish, I don't, I, I don't know. That's how my mind works. You see, I'm all over the place. But that's, that's yeah. okay. That's a, that's a beautiful mind that is all that's over right. the place and is able to see a uvula. <laughs> yeah, it was big. You see that uvula? It's huge there, see? Oh, oh I love it. Thank you so much for sharing everybody. I. I don't want to leave out Linda. She saw all kinds of animals and um, sea creatures, specifically a lot of them. And actually so did Charlie. And I was just the odd man out. So our story was about how my alien, because uh, I've had aliens and volcanoes and ghosts in mine. So go figure. Um, how my alien came to meet uh, Linda's penguins and whales. So we had a good, awesome. we had a good time. Yeah. Well, just to be fair, I didn't share that I also had a lawn gnome and an olive. So, you know, <laughs> Thanks, we're not Charlotte. necessarily. 
remember one of the biggest things is not to be critical and judge our art we just we just honor it for what it is and we look at it and think wow we saw that in the scribble so we're awesome so give, yeah. give yourself a big pat on the back for seeing those things in your scribble so perfect well on that note i want to thank you again charlotte for an amazing evening i had so much fun with you ladies i hope to see you again in two weeks when we're going to be talking about another kind of self-care and of course after that more self-care and more self-care and more self-care so you guys have a great couple of weeks and hopefully we will see you back soon Thanks, yeah, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Tell all Good your night. friends how much fun we have in Biden. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, okay. we're going to be, we're, are we going to post this or the uh, recorded version, Margaret? Or uh, yeah. we'll, we can let people know. Okay. That's great. Oh, thank thank you, you. Thanks, Charlotte. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.